Good evening, afternoon, or morning, wherever you are in the world. This is uh, another installment of Italy Week here on World War II TV, and we are off to Italy with men of the 36th Texas Division, but a particular company that made up the 141st Regiment. And my guest today is an author of a fine book about this particular unit. Dave Gutierrez over in the States. Good afternoon or morning for you, Dave. How are you? <laughs> yeah, good morning. Good morning from uh, San Jose, California. Thank you. So uh, before we leap into talking about the unit, I always ask people, in your case, it's an easy answer to this time, but how did you get involved in this story? What prompted you to do the research? Yeah, I had a relative who served in the unit, uh, Ramon Gutierrez from Del Rio, Texas. And uh, I was, was fascinated with his story and uh, I just wanted to find a way to be able to record and document his story. And uh, after five years of research, I was able to originally self-publish the book. And, and uh, brilliant. And how easy was it in terms of archives? I always ask that. Is, is there lots of things going on with access to archives these days with COVID and what have you? Obviously, you did the work some years ago now. But was it was right. it an easy process? Did it take longer than you thought it was going to be? Did you find more information you were hoping for, or, or less than you were hoping for? What's the what? How did it work out for you? Well, this. I became a first time writer. I, this was such an important story for me that I, I felt that I had to try to get the story out there. So the research was long, uh, tedious. It took me five years of research to finally self publish the book. A lot of it uh, was genealogy research, as a matter of fact. I used genealogy research as a foundation uh to connect with over 60 different families of the men that served with my cousin in world war ii and that's pretty impressive Six, 60 members of a company we're talking now i guess it was would have been 65 years plus since the events i mean there are people writing books now where they're lucky if they meet one veteran or one family these days. But right. I guess as we'll find out with the show you're talking about a reasonably close knit community that provided this company so i suppose every person you contact you kind of led you to someone else and it the right. spiders web connected which is always good yes so yes what we, we you know the, your book is entitled patriots from the barrio so so where is what's the for those who haven't ever been to that part of the world what would define <laughs> where these guys come from what would life have been like in the early 20th century for these guys yeah, these these guys were all from uh, South Texas or or El Paso, Texas. This is an original Texas National Guard unit out of El Paso, Texas. Um, so a lot of these men uh, were from the Mexican section of town in El Paso, and we call we in in our, in our heritage we, that's that's our barrio. So uh, when I was first writing the book, I, I had several different titles for, for the book. And um, I, well, before I finally came up with the title Patriots from the Barrio. Uh, and again, the, 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 you put the screen up and the one on the left there is the self-published book that I released in 2014. And later, uh, I signed a deal with West Home Publishing, which now released this new edition in 2018. I mean, we'll talk about the fact later on that there's now, you know, the, it's been optioned. I mean, we're going to hopefully see a TV show. So to go from sure. not having written a book to self-publishing to getting a publishing deal to get the option, you've had the, the dream start to a writing career in terms of World <laughs> War II. <laughs> the, most, most people don't get those steps quite so neatly like that. So kudos to you. It, it, it's obviously a compelling story to go through those stages. So um, thank you. It's so um, this is your this is your cousin. Um, right. Um, I, I grew up listening to my dad tell me stories about this this heroic uh, cousin of ours in World War Two. Now, as a kid, I, I heard all the stories. You know, he served in the U.S. Army with the 36th Division, captured twice by the German Army, escaped both times, making it back across Allied lines, becomes one of only a few Americans to be decorated for valor on the battlefield by the Soviet Union during World War II. So knowing all of this information and, you know, I got into genealogy research 
connected with a relative of mine, Gloria Cadena, here in San Jose, California. And uh, from there, that after meeting with my cousin for the first time, uh, and we discussed her uncle Ramon, uh, I, I left their home that day saying, why hasn't anyone ever put this man's story together? And uh, really, that was the catalyst for me to, to start writing uh, his story. But I'm, I'm, and I'm not going to kind of cast doubt on things, but one of the things, of course, when everyone starts researching via the families first is that sometimes within a family's legends um, increase slightly, things get made. Yes. The amount of time as I, as a normally tour guide, I'm sure. not, I'm oh, he was first wave, he was decorated three times, he was right, general right. driver, this, that, and you actually research it and you find out you kind of drop it down a peg or two. Uh, but but right. it's a good place to start. Fam families, of course cherish their histories so that's the point is or usually they do it's a good starting point and then the after action reports and the official documents then um Correct. confirm or deny what you find out so yes yeah there was a lot of legend as as you as you mentioned there's a lot of legend uh, with this group uh they were and what made them unique was the fact that they were the only all mexican american u.s army unit in world war ii and that, uh, sorry, sorry to just leap in there. And that is obviously we're going to be talking about that aspect and, of course, the fighting in Italy. But the I think right at the beginning when we had our pre-chat yesterday, it's, mm -hmm. I want to know what the reasons were within this regiment for grouping the Mexicans together in one company because sure. it sounds a negative, but it easily could be a positive. This is what, I, this is what occurred to me because I was thinking of the Powell's Battalions in the First <coughs> World War in Britain where it stands to reason. If you've got people who are all from the same industrial town, they all work in the same cotton mill, they work down the same coal mine, whatever it is, is you put them together in a unit because you don't have to then instill brotherhood. Brotherhood and, com and camaraderie exists. So, so we're talking National Guard. So explain mm -hmm. a little bit about how the National Guard morphs and why they grouped the Mexicans together and what the sure. rationale behind that was. Sure. Okay. So we have to think about, it's 1939 and this is a great, great photo of, of them. This is the original Texas National Guard unit out of El Paso. Now there was two National Guard units in El Paso in 1939. Company H was all Anglo and Company E was made up of all of the men from the barrios of El Paso. In, 100% Mexican Americans. And they maintained that 100% Mexican American unit in, until they started re, uh, receiving casualties in World War II. Um, I think your next slide um, has, okay, here's, here's, the, here's the photo of the entire company. There's about 250 men here. All of the officers are Anglo, yet every enlisted men of Company E uh, was of Mexican American descent. And when this is actually in Camp Bowie in Brownwood, Texas, this is October 1941. And when they arrived at Camp Bowie, the 36th Division actually pulled out other Mexican Americans from other units, from let's say that they were from the Dallas area or the San Antonio area. Uh, they actually put them in. Uh, in Company E, and what the 36th Division didn't realize what they were doing at the time is they're actually pulling out veterans who had been with the Texas National Guard for years. So when you put a bunch of veterans together in, in a company, and you know, obviously they bonded from their heritage, they really stood out in training and on the battlefield during World War II. Mm. But yeah, you know, but there there could be from the outside a negative. I mean, we don't we don't have to talk about this the whole show. We're going to talk about their exploits and combat. But you know, we've mm -hmm. we, in the last couple of weeks we've addressed the um uh the six triple eight, the African American postal unit. We've talked about the female wasp pilots. We've we've talked about lots of occasions where the military, in their infinite wisdom, group the people they don't particularly want into one unit to get rid of them. Um, and, but in this case, it, the positive is you create this unit of, with incredible um, heritage connection. They've got the bonds, they know, and you bring in veterans. But you know, how is the what I'm kind of getting to is the, in the National Guard in Texas, there mm -hmm. would have been inherent racism within that organization in the, in the 1930s. Cor correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, well, they were separated for a reason. Uh, and I mean, Company H was all Anglo. And yeah. so you, you have two units 
and and this unit is completely of Mexican American descent, and this this unit is 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 Anglo, and I believe Company H was a uh, was a weapons platoon, uh, right. and then Company E was an infantry unit. Um, uh, so as as part of the same thirty six infantry division, or you know, uh, yeah. in, in in within the unit. But you know, so we have this unit, all Mexicans. Um, mm -hmm. Some are some are veterans, some are some are National Guard. Then obviously they're as you said they're pulling in big mother people during their training. What what do you think kind of set them apart apart from that heritage? I mean, are are the, are they particularly skillful in terms of um, fitness, or have they got a, an attitude about warfare that sets them apart? Is their officers are their officers good? What because all units when you look at the units that go on to be good, there's always some mm -hmm. kind of little seed that we can look back at, ah, oh, well, it's because of that. There's that little seed of something that creates, if you like, an elite unit. What, what do you think What do you think the magic was with Company E? I, I, I really think it was the bond that they had with each other. And, you know, sometimes uh, these units are put together and they're meeting each other for the first time. These, these men knew each other from grade, since grade school, a lot of them since grade school. Uh, they went to the same high school. M most of them came out of Bowie High School in, in in El Paso there. And so it was kind of like a Bowie High School reunion in Company E uh, during World War II. And then you had men from, uh, like my cousin, who was from Del Rio, Texas, uh, arrived in January of 1941 uh, with the unit. And, uh, uh, you know, they came over from all, all parts of, uh, of South uh, Texas uh, to join this, what, what I considered already, they were a very elite group. Mm. Um, they were the honor, the honor company of 2nd Battalion and the 140, uh, 141st. Which is pretty cool. And also, we're, we're talking about a unit, perhaps like the 29th Division, the 36th Texas, had a long time to train. I mean, towards the latter part of 44, 45, it is uh, uh, the nature of the beast then that units are being pulled together very quickly. Uh, the 90-day officers are coming through. But 41, mm -hmm. I mean, this the, the, you know, this company is in, in existence before Pearl Harbor's even happened. So th there's <laughs> lots of time to, to, to train, lots of times to develop techniques. And then and their baptisms are fire, which we'll talk about. You know, they arrive in, in the in the you know, North African theater and Tunisia and, and Italy, but they, they've had a long time to get prepared. And, and that's, that's a testament to some of these units that have longer. I mean, the 29th division famously in Normandy, by the time they land on June the 6th, some of them have been together since 1937, 1938, again, national guard. So if you're yeah. together that long, theoretically you get good at things. So, um, yep. that's, so that's, here, here they were in 1939 training together, uh, you know, December 7th, 1941, we, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and America's thrust it into war. Uh, from Camp Bowie after, after Pearl Harbor, uh, Company E, or the 36th Infantry Division now, had moved over to Camp Landing, Florida, where they were doing some type of uh, training there. They were part of the Carolina maneuvers in, in early of 1942. Then they found themselves up north at Camp Edwards in Massachusetts, where they were actually doing what the U.S. Army was. This was new training. The U.S. Army was calling Ranger training by British commandos. And they had a, uh, one of the British commandos come out and was one of the teachers. And they were, I believe, they were the second unit uh, to come through there. I believe the 45th Division came through Camp Edwards first. And then the 36th Division was the second unit to go through uh, what the U.S. Army was now calling Ranger training. So there we are. We've, we've already hit on the, the secret. It was the British. It was the British influence <laughs> was the secret recipe there. I'm just saying that to be facetious because um, it makes me laugh. But, yeah, the, the British commandos, um, that's it. We can end the show now. That's the secret. That's the recipe. It was the British commando. No, it's. I'm just, I'm just going off on a ridiculous tangent then. But let's talk about the 36th Texas Division and when they arrive in Italy, because that's the purpose of the show, essentially, is Italy. So sure. um, how, how do they get um, sent out to, to the to the theater? Was there any, but they're, cause they're in this, they don't go into combat immediately. So run through a little bit of their history, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, uh, in April of 1943, they sailed from New York Harbor to North Africa, landed in North Africa, and they continued to train. Uh, the 36th Division, uh, had a 
had a T, what they call the T patch as, yeah. as their symbol. Uh, and they used to joke around and said they only stood for training because that's all they were doing. Uh, here they were. It, it's, it's in the middle of 1943 and they were still training. They were doing amphibious training in, in North Africa. Well, Patton races across the island of Sicily uh, and, you know, gets to Messina before Montgomery. And then, um, and then Italy is now the new front. Now we have to remember that the Russians have been fighting the Germans on the Eastern front for a long time. So they're very eager to find out what, what is going to happen in this new front that the allies are going to open up. And there was a lot of uh, debate about where to land uh, to make the invasion. Uh, I believe Montgomery went in at the toe of Italy uh, in, in early uh, uh, in September. And then the 36th Division uh, spearheaded the Allied landing at Salerno. So they were part of the first Allied landing on the European continent. Yeah. The 36th were the first Americans on the European continent, weren't they? If, uh, yeah. So, and, and then, yeah, the Italy campaign, we could go off on that whole tangent of Churchill and the soft underbelly of Europe and whether it's a political campaign or is it, is, you know, the, our, there's lots of things we could talk about there that we're not going to, but you're absolutely right. There were lots of debates about where we should land, how we should land, and it ends up being, we discussed that with Gareth last night and the Indian regiments, a, 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 a place where lots and lots of different nationalities of armies end up, you know, Poles mm -hmm. and New Zealanders and Australians and Gurkhas and Indians. And it's, it's a, it's a fa fascinating theater and multiple landings, multiple campaigns. Some bits go well, some bits don't go well, but um, we ought to bring into this point there, this figure here. Yes. Um, um, General so Mark Clark is, is a, sorry, I'll, I'll let you talk, is a, is a fascinating, like most people of his rank, very divisive. Some people think he's brilliant. Some people don't think he's 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 quite so brilliant. Um, the show isn't about General Mark Clark. I might do a Mark Clark special one day, but he he's 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 a player in this, and he'll come into the story much later when we get to the Rapido River. So, um, sure. what's your what's your um, author's point of view of General of Mark Clark? Well, Mark Mark Clark uh, rose quickly in the ranks. Uh, during his army career. He did serve during World War I, was wounded on the first day that he got there, and never saw, never saw the front lines again. Uh, he was hit with shrapnel. And um, after World War I, uh, he was out in, in, at Fort Lewis in Washington for a while. But what really helped Mark Clark rise uh, is the fact that one of his best friends, was David Eisenhower. They were friends together at West Point. And as David Eisenhower rose, so did uh, Lieutenant General Mark Clark. And when the 36th Division arrived in North Africa, they were attached to General Mark Clark's Fifth Army. Uh, and of course, uh, they were the ones that spearheaded the landing at Salerno, Italy. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and we've got a photo here of of the thirty six coming ashore in Salerno, and um, it they the landing itself went okay, and then it gets a little bit tricky in the next few weeks, and the thirty six end up deploying along a massive great front against lots of counterattacks. So, as as they go into combat, how do Company E get get on in their in their first taste of um, of, of of fighting? Well, we have to remember that the day before they were on the boats ready to land and over the loudspeaker, they hear that Italy has surrendered. <laughs> so they're on, they're on, on these boats ready to land on the Italian shoreline and they hear that Italy has surrendered. Um, however, the German army was still very well entrenched and as they came across uh, they take they took heavy heavy casualties as as they landed uh, on the Pastian beaches uh, of Salerno, and uh, my cousin Ramon was part of an advanced squad. And as they came across uh, on on land, uh, they were halted by five German tanks and a machine gun uh, that was firing at them. And I believe you have a next slide. Yeah. Okay. So here's 
here's my cousin Ramon's silver star citation. And uh, we're not going to read it through it, but I can tell you what, what basically it says. Yes, please. Um, so he witnesses a few of the men of Company E killed right in front of him. Uh, the, the, mar the, the tanks are firing at him. The machine gun nest from behind is firing at him with deadly accuracy. And later Ramon would later say in life that, you know, he didn't think he was going to make it that day. So he really didn't care what had happened to him. He goes and charges the machine gun nest with his Browning automatic rifle. It gets shot out of his hand. He gets shot in the arm and he continues to charge the machine gun nest without a rifle. S throws a hand grenade into the machine gun nest and silences it, killing three German soldiers. Then he jumps into the foxhole and kills the last German soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat with a knife. And for that action, uh, the U.S. Army awarded him the Silver Star. Now, what's interesting about this whole incident is that the Soviet Union had sent an officer at Salerno as an observer. They were, like I said, they were very eager to yeah. find out what the Allies were going to do on this new front. And uh, the officer hears what 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 happens that. Uh, that my cousin Ramon had charged the machine gun nest and kills a last German soldier in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Well, the officer puts in for a medal and later on, uh, the Russian ambassador would present the Secretary of State Cordell Hall with the Order of Patriotic War, second degree for my cousin Ramon, becoming one of a few Americans to be decorated for valor on the battlefield by the Soviet Union. Yeah, it, it, it's a, an unusual, an unusual occurrence there. Certainly, um, it's it, and it and it testament to the, the 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 bravery of your cousin, but also the unit general generally. And you've got other people we're going to be talking about as well. Um, sure. And yeah, the, the the Italian campaign is kind of very stop and start, and things go well, then they immediately followed by things that don't go as well. Then you have a good. It's a, it's an odd one to study. You know, it's. Uh, the Germans have some decent troops there, some decent units there. It's obviously with it being a skinny country, there's no kind of question of which way we're going. It's obvious which way we're going to go. So the Germans kind of know what we're trying to do. And um, we're not going to get into the whole Italian campaign as such, but within within you know, hours, so so it seems that the E-Company seem, seem to, to do very well and make a name for themselves. Um We've got other people we're going to talk about here. Please, please continue with the stories, and I will jump sure. in when I when I've got questions. Thank you, thank you, um, Gabriel Navarrete. There on the left uh, was actually leading the advance squad uh, during during the when they ran into five enemy tanks. He was wounded, uh, hit hit in, in, in one of the hand in his hands, and would later go back to North Africa. And when he came back. Uh, he, this, Gabriel was a sergeant at the time. When he comes back uh, to the front lines later, he's commissioned an officer in the United States Army. Now, that's interesting in itself because while they were training in El Paso, uh, Gabriel was such a, a good soldier that a lot of the officers said, you know, your, off your officer's material, we should send you to officer's candidate school. So... He takes the written test, passes it, and when he's taking the verbal test, they tell him, you know what, we, we're not going to let you go to officer's candidate school because you have too much of an accent. That was the reason why they told him he couldn't go to officer's candidate school. Three times Gabriel had taken that test. Three times he passed it, took the verbal, and they told him all three times, I'm sorry, we're not going to let you go. Uh, so it was not until he proved his bravery on the battlefield that he was commissioned an officer in the United States Army. Gabriel Navarrete would later go on to become the commanding officer of Company E. Wow. Now, Sergeant Rafael Torres, very important part of my research. Um, I actually uh, connected with his granddaughter, uh, Sonia, who is in Iowa. She sent me his personal memoirs. And when she did, I figured I was going to get a few pages. 
Rafael Torres had written over 200 pages of his personal memoirs of what happened to them during World War II. Uh, so I had firsthand knowledge. Uh, a lot of my book, you'll, you'll hear Rafael's own words of what he was thinking and what was happening. Rafael Torres was wounded at the Battle of Salerno. He himself was fighting off German tanks with an old Springfield rifle and was shot in the shoulder uh, trying to get to one of his, uh, was his wounded men. Uh, wow. He would later come back and um, along with Gabriel Navarrete, they arrived when the, when the unit was later at Mount Rotundo and uh, Sergeant Rafael Torres was wounded during the Battle of San Pedro and he was wounded so bad, a lot of the, the men, as they passed by him on the road, thought he was dead. And they were shocked to see him alive later. Uh, but he lived to be in his 90s, uh, Rafael Torres. I'm just thinking how, how wonderful it must have been that, that day when you received the 200 plus pages. Because to have a, a voice like that, you can thread through a book like that. That's that, that's that best day at the office kind of day that some you absolutely you get and you go fantastic i've got that voice i can put it all through there um and and I'm, i like the story about the fact that you know the gabriel there eventually got the commission because a couple of questions came up in the sidebar there there was no official segregation of latinos in the u.s army there may have been some unofficial preju prejudice going on but there, there was nothing to actually affect um, officially stop anybody rising up through the ranks. It was maybe just the structure around would, I get, I think to me, when I hear the fact they, they his accent was too strong, I think that's kind of an excuse, but yeah, that's just my interpretation. <laughs> but you know, it, it, when, when they proved themselves, there was, there was the ability to pro progress up the ranks, which is uh, alas, something the African-Americans didn't get um, at that time. So um, we've got to bring in also the commanding officer, the 30, well, well, we'll talk about Kesselring as well at some point. But here's mm -hmm. a fascinating figure as well, Fred Fred W. L. Walker there. Um, yes. Because he he had been senior to Mark Clark earlier, hadn't he? This, this is one of those interesting personal dynamics you get a bit like Bradley and Patton. So, so run mm -hmm. through the backstory of that, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Uh, so Major General Fred Walker was the commanding officer of the 36th Division during World War II. Now, Fred Walker, while he was teaching at West Point, one of his students was Mark Clark. And as I mentioned how quickly Mark Clark uh, rose through the ranks, uh, he actually outranked his teacher at West Point. And not only did he outrank his teacher, Fred Walker finds himself now under the command of General Mark Clark. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, that was, uh, I could see, I could tense, sense the animosity between the two, uh, how Walker, I read Walker's uh, personal memoir that he wrote uh, from Rome to Texas. So if anybody's wanting to learn a little bit more about the 36th Infantry Division during World War II, I highly recommend Fred Walker's book uh, from Rome to Texas, or I'm sorry, from Texas to Rome, I should say. Yeah. I mean, this, and this, folks, this has some bearing on what's coming on later on, because when we get to the Rapido River, these two figures get embroiled in this, this controversy, blame thing. And I think it's important to understand there's, we'd say in English, there's some previous there. They've had, they've had an experience. There's some, I, you know, I don't know what you were to use, rivalry, um, competition. Um, animosity. Animosity. That, that's how I that's how I saw it. Uh, the way the way uh, Walker wrote in his in his books, in his memoirs, he actually carried a personal diary uh, during the whole time. He was always writing in there. And as he he was writing, he was he was jotting down uh, information like uh, the U.S. Army's uh, new tactics of quickly um, moving people forward is getting to be a little bit ridiculous. So, um, you know, you, you, you could sense that there was something there. Uh, and you have, you have to, you have to put yourself in, in Fred Walker's shoes at the time, uh, at the time. Fred Walker was, was part, uh, was also in world war one. Now during world war one, Fred Walker was commanding a unit at the Marne river with the third division. Fred Walker's unit was in a defensive position at the Marne River. 
And when the Germans tried to cross the Marne River, his third division slaughtered thousands of Germans trying to cross the river. And Fred Walker for that was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and was nicknamed the Rock of the Marne uh, during, during that. So he, he had a lot of history and a lot of experience. And when he sees that these other officers are, are quickly being elevated over him, you know, you, you could sense uh, the animosity there. Yeah, and, and, and yet from the other, to, to play devil's advocate, if you're looking at World War II in the bigger view and you look at the National Guard divisions, they may, as well as their training, sometimes their training is a little bit more old-fashioned compared to the war-created units because they're, they're employing techniques they've been using for years at the annual training camps. And so, you know, you think of the 29th Division compared to the 1st Division or the 45th Division, which is the National Guard, sometimes as good as they are. And you get the same applies to the British as well. The territorial units may be better trained, but better trained in the last doctrine, not the current doctrine. So maybe mm. Mark Clark represents more of a, the newer way of doing things, whereas Walker represents the older way of doing things. That's a very sweeping generalization there. And I'm probably not putting enough uh, nuance into it there, but th 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 there no, is, I totally is, understand some interest there. Yeah, and, and and in opposition, just we just want to mention that you know when we've got Clark and we've got um, Walker, we've got uh, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring on the other side, a Luftwaffe Field Marshal who is he's he's pretty good. He's 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 not the not the best, not been, by far means the worst German commander uh, in World War Two, and has in Italy some pretty fine forces at his disposal. And the, the, as we just addressed earlier, the advantage of defending Italy is you can put some fairly narrow lines because of the width of the country and put a lot of resources behind it and and therefore make a tough nut, tough nut to crack. So some interesting characters in the Italian campaign. But when in, going talking about these characters, within the company, e, the, the unit you obviously wrote about, mm -hmm. did did the men discuss much about the divisional commanders and the fifth army commanders? Is that, is it something that they talk about or, or are they more concerned with just the boots on the ground and, and the, 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 the enemy gunfire coming in or, 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 or do they give a shit about the command structure? <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, they pretty much wanted to focus on their area. What was happening around them? Um, Really, they really didn't get into the the political aspect of, you know, the the, the commanders and, and and so forth. They were trying to get the job done and make it home back to South Texas or El Paso, Texas. That's 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 what, that's what was on their minds. But yeah. you had Albert Kessel ring there, and prior to the Salerno invasion, the Allies tried to decapitate him, <laughs> take him out, assassinate him by bombing his headquarters the day before the 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 allied invasion at Salerno. Um, Albert Kesselring was the one that was in Hitler's ear telling Hitler that we shouldn't abandon all of Italy that because he could make the allies pay for every foot of ground they gained in Italy. Uh, I believe it was Rommel who was telling Hitler we should just abandon and get out of Italy completely and and you know protect the homeland and it was kesselring who was in in hitler's ear saying oh no i can make i can make them pay and albert kesselring was the one that came up with his defensive lines uh in italy uh starting at the volturno river with the first one the mm. second one in the central mountains of italy uh that he called the bernhardt line and then the gustav line at monte casino in the rapido river yeah, and that, that's a very good point because w when we're talking about that 44 period, most German generals know the war is lost by this point. It's a question of what you now do. Now, some of the generals were thinking, well, let's just kind of get to a point where we can have some sort of negotiated peace. Some of the SS fanatics just want to die for the fear and don't really give a shit about winning or losing. And then you've got other people like Kesselring who are, as you say there, let's make every single uh, life count let's make them pay heavily for this and 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 that's that's our way of not winning but making the allied victory less of a victory if you kill more of the allies to get to achieve it so there's lots of different things going on there and um 
but yeah, we're, 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 we should move on and talk about some of these other amazing heroes. So um, there we are, another one to talk about. Okay, so uh, after Salerno, the Germans had pulled back at the Volturno River. Uh, they continued fighting. Uh, and they went into San Pietro. Uh, Mount Rotundo, then San Pietro with the 36th Infantry Division, where the 141st Infantry took heavy casualties at San Pietro. And this is December of 1944. They find themselves after San Pietro one mile from the Rapido River and the Gustav Line. Now, it's January of 1944 now. The Allies landed in Salerno in September. It's taken them over three months to get to Casino near the Rapido River. And Fred Walker is given orders to cross the Rapido River. Now, Fred Walker knows what's going to happen. He, was, he knows what happens when you try to cross a heavily defended river. He did that. He was on the opposite side in World yeah. War I at the Marne yeah. River. And now he's given orders and he writes in his diary. Uh, I don't think we're going to we have any chance of making this where they're asking me to cross at, uh, at the Rapido River. Uh, but we're going to give it everything we got and we're going to try to do that. Well, in a span of 48 hours, the 36th Division would lose 2,000 men in its attempt to cross the Rapido River. It's basically known as one of the most colossal blunders of the United States Army during World War II. Now, Fred, uh, if you had another slide up there with Ricardo yep. Palacios. There we go. Ricardo Palacios Jr., El Paso, Texas, was leading one of the, uh, one of the platoons across the Rapido River. Company E was one of the few companies that actually got men across the Rapido River. There was a mile between their position and the to Rapido River. And between that one mile, many of those men were killed stepping on mines and heavy artillery and um, rocket fire uh, being uh, fired on them. Ricardo Palacios was one of the men that was captured uh, across the Rapido River and would spend 16 months in a German POW camp. Mm. Yeah. Do you have another slide? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, yeah. So here's Ricardo Palacios. He was one of maybe nine men that was still alive when I was doing research on the book. And he passed away in September of 2017. Mm. I mean, going, going uh, incredible. Going back to the Rapido River, this is where this interplay that we hinted at between Clark and Walker comes into play. But, and, and, the, and the British come into the story as well, of course, because sure. immediately after this unsuccessful uh, crossing of the river, the British or do uh, oper it's Operation Shingle, isn't it? And we try to outflank and we do the Anzio landings. And it ends up meaning that strategically, this whole crossing of the river has now, at the very least, has been questioned and, at the, and possibly has been a complete waste of time, depending on where you want to put it in that range. And many historians and authors have have thrashed this out and it's we're not going to go into the complete nitty gritty of which it is but it is a complicated and and um interesting situation that causes debate this day and by the way folks rapido river um is how it's referred to within the military lines it actually was the attributed the gary river that the, the uh the, the crossing was on but when we're looking at the after action reports and all the re the combat evaluations and the studies it, and the veterans themselves it's always referred to as the rapido river that's that's correct isn't it dave yes absolutely but what what so run through this this out this aftermath in terms of the politics behind it from a higher level, and then if you wouldn't mind share some sure. of what the men who actually endured it, what they said about it, because it, it's two story, two sides of the story. There's a kind of the leadership side, then there's the poor guys on the ground who have to endure it. So <laughs> a little bit more, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, who have to actually cross the river. Uh, so they're crossing the Rapido River in. On, they start January twentieth, nineteen forty four. At the same time, they're swinging around and landing at Anzio, uh, Operation Shingle. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, actually, the road to Rome was open. They could have just walked into Rome 
And instead of walking into Rome, because of what happened to them at Salerno, they decided to put up a defense around the beachhead at, at Anzio and did not move. Well, Kesselring had time to maneuver and get his, his troops in position and held them at, on the beachhead at Anzio. Now, during the Rapido River crossing, uh, Mark Clark was enamored with trying to get his armor across the Casino Valley. He wanted those tanks rolling over the Rapido River and, and into that. And the third, again, the 36th Division would lose 2,000 men in its attempt to cross the Rapido River uh, in January of 1944. I mentioned to you that my cousin Ramon had been captured twice by the German army. One of those times was across the Rapido River. Uh, he had gone into the river. When he came out, he didn't have a rifle anymore. He ended up on the German side, and he's captured. He's, after being beaten a little bit, he comes, uh, they're taking him uh, to the German side of the, of the river. And as he's being led, my cousin Ramon is, keeps tripping and falling. And he doesn't understand what he's, he's falling over dead Americans. Uh, on the German side of the river. One of those times that he falls, he just stays down. And because of the heavy fog that was there on the river, the German soldiers that were escorting him just walked right by him. And he ends up on the German side of the river for several hours before he swims back across. Uh, Company E crossed with 154 men at the Rapido River. Only 27 of them would make it back. Yeah. They were either killed, wounded, or captured. And, and this, is, this is where I think it's really fascinating. And, and again, there's a the quote from the, one of the uh, um, commanders in the 143rd about that. He said, I'm just reading it now, uh, I had 184 men, 48 hours later, I had 17. If that's not mass murder, I don't know what is. Um, and this is, we get this with various things on World War II TV, it comes up with the Falaise Gap, who is responsible for closing the Falaise Gap or not closing it, whatever. You get it with Arnhem. Is it becomes this which general screwed up debate. Um, and right. we could go down that rabbit hole of, is it Clark? Is it Walker? Is it is it Clark? For, is, it, is it the general allied doctrine policy? That's all interesting stuff. We're not going to do that. What matters is what the men on the ground think, because all this talk about whose fault at the top is ultimately just subjective because everyone's got a different opinion. Sure. But what doesn't change, as you've just said there, is how many Mexican-Americans in Company E died or were wounded in this crossing. That's actually the bigger and more important story than yeah. whether or not there's some blame you can attribute. Well, not more important, but as important, and more important on a human scale. So when you, you, know, when you were conducting, you, you said you know, these 60 families you contacted, Mm -hmm. um, when you're starting to talk to people and the Rapido River comes up, is there still bitterness? Is there still anger amongst the veterans about families? Or do they just not see it in that way and think about it just another t uh, another day in combat for the men? Well, it, it was not just another day in combat uh, of course. because they lost a lot of, of, of men there uh, and a lot of friends. Um and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Captain Shape in a little bit. Yeah. But prior to, to the actual crossing, Company E did two patrols across that river. Now, Gabriel Navarrete, who had just been commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army, was leading one of the patrols across that river. Uh, from their position on Mount Crocchio, they could see across the river, and Gabriel's looking through his binoculars and saying, hey, there's machine gun nests here. I could see machine gun nests where you guys on the maps tell me that there's no machine gun nests. I need to see if I'm going to cross this river tomorrow or, or, you know, the next day, I need to see what's out there. So he, he goes in and patrols the night before. Well, they get slaughtered. That patrol gets annihilated. Gabriel is wounded very badly. Um, uh, a, a few of the men uh, were shot and killed, and they finally make it back uh, to the American side of the river. 
Well, he gets back to the river and, and he's they're asking him, so what do you think? Gabriel, can we can we cross? He goes, heck no, we can't cross. We cross here, we're gonna, we're all gonna get killed. And he, the officer, uh, the battalion commander is telling him, I'm not talking about just your patrol, Gabriel. I'm talking about uh, you know the the entire second battalion uh, of the 141st. He goes, if you send the second battalion across that river, we're all gonna die. <laughs> and he's telling him that. And they're arguing back and forth uh, because they don't understand each other. Gabriel knows firsthand. He's, he's seen what, what's on the other side of the river, and the intelligence reports are all wrong. Um, he knows that they're going to get slaughtered. And uh, because that festered down and everybody saw what happened across that river, they knew what was, ha what was coming. Um, but they had orders and they still crossed. And Company E was one of the few companies that actually got across the river. Many of them, like Ricardo Palacios, uh, we talked about, was captured because they ran out of ammunition, I mean, ammo uh, on, the, on the German side of the river. And mm. they, they, they were forced to, to, to give up and and be taken prisoners. And this is where it becomes a much more interesting story because all the dis all the discussions that still endure about whose fault it was, should it was it was it worth could it be avoided it completely? Should we have not crossed? Should we have just all that is Monday morning quarterbacking? The fact right. is, you're saying officers and men in that unit before it even happened were predicting it, and that that is a a, a much more important and much more tragic story that mm -hmm. it could have been avoided before the event uh, and crossing a river like that and rapido river it's, it's not very wide but it's steep banks winding meandering river and um, mm -hmm. we have as there's, there's the conversation in the sidebar there there's you know 15 pounds of panzer grenadier division the other side there well dug in good views machine guns armored vehicles mortars artillery all trained on the river and it doesn't matter how many men you have on uh, in a battalion, you can't get them across instantly. You've got to go boat by boat, get it, getting out of those boats, getting up the river banks. You do not get enough firepower into action quick enough. You're coming across in penny packets, and the Germans are taking out these penny packets. And, and as Sheldrake is saying there, when you're standing on the German side and you see the flat open and muddy, well, thanks for reminding us, that the that that winter had been just a crappy one of weather, so it was just a mud bath everywhere. So even maneuvering right. it quickly and efficiently in that, you're slipping and sliding. You, you you're not move. You can't get it. It was it was something that could have been avoided. And and again, I, I'm stressing the fact that this decision about whether there's a command fail at the top is all very interesting. What is much more interesting is what these men on the ground actually had to endure, and 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 any bitterness that they they have about it is far more justified than history armchair historians deciding which general they think screwed up is right. all well and good but the men who came back and still and still and that's what as you said there they did the attack anyway even though they knew it was gonna or they suspected it was going to be a disaster they did it anyway because they are well tra trained well motivated disciplined unit that do what they're told because that's how the army works and and uh they, they felt that they were on, on a suicide mission um, dur during the Rapido River crossing. And you brought up a, a very interesting point about the officers, the command, whether or not they were, you know, who's at fault here or, or whatnot. But for me, in the book, I wanted to make sure that the readers understood what was happening uh, to this unit. And because you're following this unit from the Barrios of Texas all the way to the battlefields in, in Italy. So what got them there? Why were they in Italy? Uh, all of that is in the book because I wanted the readers to clearly understand what brought these men in a foxhole ready to cross in the mud. And, and we, we talked about a little bit about the mud there. Uh, yes, it's the winter of January of 1944. Kesselring also had the Germans dam the river and it was completely flooded in that area. And he did it on purpose. And he, the reason why he did that is because he didn't want that, those tanks rolling across the river either. Uh, let them get stuck in the mud there. Um, so all of that, I, I tried to in, in, encompass all of that so that the readers get a clear understanding 
of what was going on. And, and I basically wanted to put the reader in the mud, in the foxhole yeah. with Company E. And I think that's exactly that. I'm glad you made that point because I say that the 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 who was at fault at the co at a command level is just a discussion that will roll on for for as long as people discuss World War Two battles for seventy like, years. <laughs> who, who who was at fault at Arnhem? Who was at fault at this? Who that that? And there's and there's ultimately no there's no definitive answer. It's a historian makes their case and they put their blame on Clark or Alexander or Walker or whatever it would be. Or Monty, it's just blame Monty. He's in a different country, but it's always worth blaming Monty, even if he's just you know somewhere else because he's an easy target. But what matters, as you say, is these men on the ground and what they did. So you've got some more interesting people to talk. And Paul Reed, by the way, who's joining in there, is a is a tour guide and been to Rapido River, uh, obviously numerous times. And as, you know, I think it's interesting that he wouldn't like to cross it now. And and it's you know it's one of those places. That it, I haven't been there, but like most battlefields, once you've been there, you kind of go, yeah, okay, there's, there's no question about it. This was just stupid. Um, mm -hmm. The enemy has too much of our, but let's let's talk about some of the people again. So we got um, this this gentleman here. Sure, Eduardo, Eduardo Romo, also from El Paso, Texas, original Texas National Guard unit. He was leading a, a platoon across the river. He actually got across the river, and. He's being led by a, a new green second lieutenant. And the second lieutenant takes off his white shirt, puts it on, 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 the, on the rifle and waves it up in the air. <laughs> at, at some point, Eduardo Romo was, could not believe what he was witnessing. He's not used to this. Uh, he's, you know, he's, being, he's used to you know, finding a way to get things done or whatnot. And uh, they they're they're sur they're surrounded after the this new lieutenant puts up a, a white flag, and uh, he's captured. Spends uh, 16 months at Stalag 2B um, before he came home uh, and uh, raised his family in El Paso. Wow, incredible, incredible guys! And and thank you so much for sharing these stories because that's that's what we wanted on this show. We didn't want the highlight. We want the the men on the ground, the boots on the ground, the guys who were there. And yeah, um, yeah, another Alex, one from El Paso. Yeah, yeah, Alex Carrillo uh, was part of the weapons platoon. He, his story is very interesting. Uh, here's a guy that landed in North Africa, made the Allied landing at Salerno crosses the Rapido River, and he's part of the weapons platoon. They get across, and they're captured on, on the other side. Uh, when they're captured, Alex knows that, man, when's the next time I'm going to eat? I'm not going to eat anytime soon. He, he starts opening up a, ca uh, uh, a can, a sea ration, and, and sits down to eat, and the German's watching him, and the German goes, hey, give me that, because the Germans are just as hungry as, as they are. So they, the German starts taking his food and whatnot. When he takes his food, a shot rings out. And the German soldier who's, who's there to, you know, to guard them is shot, is nicked in the, in, the, in the arm, and he drops his rifle. Well, another man of Company E, another soldier, uh, Sergeant Jaramillo, jumps at the, at the mach German machine gun, gets it, and fires at the German, kills him. Alex Carrillo and Santiago Jaramillo were one of the 27 men that came back. They swam back across the river hours later. Uh, but incredible. Alex Carrillo, now, again, all this happens to them. He gets to the Rapido River. He lands at Anzio and then makes the landing at Operation Dragoon in southern France. He made all the Allied landings with the 36th Division during World War II. And that, and and not many men did all of them. I mean, it's one of those units that the turnover replacements in that in 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 the thirty six was you know was was heavy. So you don't get many who did the whole campaign. You know, it's uh, right. it's almost a, a fresh division that lands in the south of France. Um, uh, we'll move on. I know I know you want to talk about um, this gentleman here, um, Lieutenant sure. Barker. Lieutenant William Barker uh, was one of the officers who was assigned to Company E uh, when they were at Camp Edwards in Massachusetts. William Barker was from Lincoln, Massachusetts, and uh, he was leading a, a platoon to the river. And one of his men uh, had stepped on a mine 
and another one of his men had landed in the minefield. Lieutenant Barker crawls into the minefield and gets his wounded man out. Uh, and he's also wounded. He didn't even realize he was wounded at the time. Uh, and uh, Captain Chapin, who was the commanding officer of Company E, tells him to go back and take, take the wounded back. Uh, William Barker is, is awarded the Distinguished Service Cross uh, during the Battle of the Rapido River. And that also gets across there must have been a, a strong bond between the Mexican-American men and the white officers. They've been so far now that however they'd grown up, whatever prejudice they may have grown up with, whatever um, cultural differences they had, mm -hmm. by now they've been together in combat and they are they are the same. And the fact that he goes out to rescue one of his men is 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 interesting that there's this there is a clearly a strong bond regardless if you're in company e now whether you're white or or not white you're you're part of a of a, of a very close knit unit um right. and um yeah and no, I'm, I'm people are loving the stories by the way there is you and uh, there Martin. i am with william barker in 2015 i flew out to massachusetts uh the book had been released uh i, I was at this point after i had gotten the book out I was moving towards possibly uh, filming a documentary. And I went out there to get this man on video and, and just to make sure that uh, I get his pers overall perspective of everything. Because it was, I had like, I had Sergeant um, Torres's memoirs. And then I also had Gabriel Salazar, who was from El Paso, Texas, also wrote his memoir. So I had a little bit of that. I wanted an officer's uh, perspective, mm -hmm. and, and and Lieutenant Barker was absolutely wonderful. Uh, his memory of everything, he also kept a diary and wrote down a lot of lot of things. So he had actual dates, and Barker actually had photographs. He had, he had a photograph of them on, on Mount Trocchio uh, looking across the Rapido River. Wow. And, and it's one of those annoying things, I'm sure authors like Paul Reed watching this, is that sometimes – you can't get the best information from veterans until you've actually done a book because it's the book that is the starting point. But then people say, yeah, I like what we did there, but no, you've got that wrong. And if you, if you hadn't had the book done and you'd interviewed them before the book, yeah. that subject would have never come up in discussion. You have to present that thing yeah. to get the conversation going. It, so many historians have been in that position where the book is the starting oh, damn it, volume two or, 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 or next edition, because you get all those things that say, you know, that I'm sure that was, you, you should have put um, Sergeant So-and-So's story in there if you're telling that story. You go, yeah, okay, next edition. It, that's yeah. that eternal ongoing process that a book is never actually finished. It is only, it's only kind of uh, at rest until that new bit of information comes out that changes what or adds to what you've already written. And I'm still connecting to this day with members of Company E uh, for the first time. Uh, that, you know, family that, members. Yeah, and that's the thing that by doing that, – that's why – I like doing the shows I do in World War II TV where we look at campaigns operationally. I have the Peter Gaddick Adams and the James Hollands and the John McManus, those people. I love those guests. But I also really enjoy bringing in the people in who've written about that one unit because a book about one unit like that is social and family history as well as being World War II history. And it, 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 it ticks more boxes. Um, and that's why I like that those that kind of act that way of doing it because it's to understand the Rapido River is about understanding twenty seven men of a company, you know, getting back. That's that's the story there. Not as I say, I'm repeating myself. This who's at fault at a higher level. But this is another another. You just mentioned Captain this captain. So he's the commanding officer. Yes. Yes, uh, Captain John Shapen uh, was the commanding officer of Company. He had been with him all the way through El Paso. Um, through training, uh, Captain Shapen was supposed to be promoted several times during uh, World War II, but that would mean that he would be transferred out of the unit. So he refused promotion several times. He said, now, nah, uh, I brought these men over here from Texas, and I would like to take them home with me. Well, Captain Shapen was leading his men across the Rapido River when he was killed in action on January 22nd, 1944. And you do have a next slide there. Yeah. In the year 2000, 
uh, in near El Paso, Texas at Fort Bliss, they were opening up a new school. And because of the history of Company E and in the El Paso area, they wanted it to be named after someone uh, associated with Company E. So they went to people like Ricardo Palacios and, uh, and, and so forth, uh, Rafael Torres, who was still alive at the time. And they asked him, okay, who should we name the school after? Because we wanted it. So some, every last one of them said, name it after Captain John Chapin. So in 2000, the doors opened to Captain John L. Chapin High School, Memorial High School in El, El Paso near Fort Bliss. It is the first place I had a book signing event. I, didn't, I couldn't think of a better place than to have a, a book signing. Now, this... This picture is kind of short, but this is actually a rotunda memorial. Right. So all along the, the, the walls there on the top are the names of all of the men that served under the command of John Shapin. And in that school, it, it's, it's fascinating how the students have also embraced this area. It's actually roped off with red ropes. They're not, the students are not allowed to walk through that area. It is hollowed ground to them. Uh, so what they've done here at this school is absolutely remarkable. And uh, I, I just love the, the history that still is there. And what just out of interest, what's the demographic of the school today? Is it is it is it white kids, Mexican American kids, Latinos? What is it? Is it a bit of everybody? What's the? That's, that's just... you know that's a good question. Um, I would think it's it's highly uh, Hispanic in that area. But this is all you have to remember. This is near Fort Bliss, so a lot of a lot of the officers, a lot of the a lot of the army personnel who who are attached to Fort Bliss have their kids um, here here at John Chapin High School. Wow, but that's well, a good I question. Mean... I'm going to have to find that out. It, it's because uh, this this leads in really to what we're going to talk about to finish the show off, which is the the, the exciting news that you yeah that there that the the book has been optioned and um, uh, Wilma Valderrama, who I remember from the seventies, that seventies show is is mainly what I know him from. Um, um, yeah. And it's when we did our pre chat yesterday, it's interesting how there are times when certain books. It's it's a it's a right time for a book to become a TV show and movie. And I think right now we talked about this. Um, the USA is split down the middle. Britain is split down the middle. Europe has got problems. We're 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 politically split. We're we're split about how we should deal with COVID. We're split about how we should deal with the future Europe. Everything's split. Split about religion. Split about everything. This ultimately is a story of working together and 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 the coming together of communities and people with different backgrounds and so so you know we, we talked about this yesterday you when you, you know you do a book and we've got you know you self-published then got published and then suddenly hollywood is interested i mean explain how exciting it was when you got that call oh sure sure uh, well for first of all I, I, after five years of research i finally self-published the book in 2014 and, and for those of you who are writers who clearly understand that that's when your work actually begins uh, because now you got to market. you got to take off the writer's hat and put on the marketing hat because you have to get this story out there in front of people. Yeah. And for a self-publisher of someone who self-published the book, that's, that's, that's a 24-7. It's all down job. to you. Yeah, no, no one yeah. helping. It's all you. So yeah. here I am. Uh, it's now 2017, three years after I self-published it. I'm still trying to get this story out there. I, I wrote this article that I was very proud of this article that I wrote. And I wanted to get it published in a very popular World War II magazine. Well, the magazine editors came back and said, uh, I'm sorry, we're not interested in that story. I was crushed. <laughs> Here, this is, this is, a, this is a, an article that I, you know, that I was very proud of. As a matter of fact, I subscribed to the magazine and I, it's one of my favorites. So I wanted to, I wanted my article in there. And then um, the same day that I get the, the rejection letter um, email, I'm looking through Facebook and my cousin Henry, which is my cousin Ramon's grandson, he's posting something about war history online. He posted a story about war history online. 
because he's also a World War II buff, just like me. And uh, I said, I thought to myself, World War, World War History Online, let me take a look at them a little bit closer. They have a million followers on Facebook alone. So I get with the editors, and within three days of me submitting the story, they publish it as me with a guest as a guest writer. So the story gets out there, it, you know, it's being, it's online. And in July of 2017, I start getting emails from somebody associated with Hollywood actor producer Wilmer Valderrama. And uh, we, after a few phone calls and, me and meetings, I flew down to LA, met with Wilmer and his production company uh, staff. And in September of 2017, Wilmer uh, obtained the film rights uh, to my book, Patriots from the Barrio. Now, Wilmer's uh, plan is to produce not a, a two hour film, but a TV series, multi episode. Wilmer's thoughts and are that it's going to take a little more than two hours to tell the story in detail the way he wants to. And uh, that was 2017. Uh, in May of last year, Wilmer signed a deal with CBS TV Studios, which part of that deal was my book, Patriots from the Barrio. So now we have CBS TV Studios on board. Uh, Wilmer has started to assemble a great group of people uh, around this project. Uh, and I'm very happy of where he's at right now. And um, hopefully we'll have some uh, announcements here very soon. Uh, but we're looking for a TV series uh, based on the true story. And that, you know, that it doesn't get better than that because that we, we've, we've talked about it so many times on World War II TV. Books are great, but books reach the people who buy books. TV, even YouTube reaches different audiences and a wider audience and and starts getting it into other people's homes who don't necessarily who are watching it because it's TV rather than World War II. They would watch a show set in space or a show set in the American West. It's because it's a TV show. And that and then you suddenly start broadening your horizon. So yeah, to, to, to ease things off to an end now, what what obviously that you, you hope the TV show happens and it looks like it is happening, but what what if for the people watching today what do you think is important to know about company e and uh, you know what's the what's the sales if you if you hadn't got the book deal the the, the tv deal and you were trying to pitch it now what what do you sure. think that the uh the, the selling point is i think it's the hispanic or mexican-american contributions to world war ii for decades our our stories have really been in the shadows of World War II history. And I think as Hispanics, we have got to get better at recording and documenting our own history. No one is gonna do it for uh, us. We have to do it ourselves. And um, again, I was shocked, first of all, that it took 70 years for this story to come to light. Um, how, do, how does an all Mexican American US Army unit story not get out there? And again, I was originally looking just to tell my cousin's story. Yeah. And then I find out that he's part of this very unique and historical U.S. Army unit uh, in the fact that they were all of Mexican-American descent. Now, I was telling you a little bit about the article and, you know, and how it led to me becoming uh, or having the book optioned. Uh, it was that article that was on War History Online, the same article that was rejected by a War wow. Day magazine well, Jack that Beckett. Wilmer read. Someone showed Wilmer this article. Hey, they said, Wilmer, you do things for, for the USO. You do stuff for veterans all the time. You should read this. It was my article on War History Online wow. uh, that led this whole thing um, to now Hollywood's involved, CBS TV Studios is involved, and uh, yeah, we're looking for uh, Wilmer's, Wilmer's production uh, companies looking to make announcements here very soon. Yeah. And this is you know, interesting because Jack Beckett, who is one of the top guys at War History Online, often watches my show. He's been a mate of mine for years. I've, I've written a couple of pieces of War History Online. And, and it's, it, it, the, 
some people disapprove of of the fact that it's an internet based history thing, but you know whatever. The point is, as you say, it reaches a lot of people, and and yeah, and yeah, the articles tend to be short, and they're, 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 but it, it it has big reach, and and this is all about how stories get told and how they get found and, and in this case it's been a perfect bit of um providence that you know and and, and coincidence they ended up getting in the hands of someone like that so and you're absolutely right because i'm a big war film buff i don't want to go too much in tangents but when you watch those old classic films you know the battle cry and naked and the dead and those the the non-white characters are so clumsily written and cliched now i didn't mm -hmm. notice it when i was watching them as teenagers I'm not going to go as far as saying they're portrayed racistly, but it's very lots of cliches, lots of yeah. The Native Americans always called chief, and the yeah, the and 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 his, Hollywood has told a very singular singular version of history. Uh, we you know we we that, that that's just the case, and uh, I'm glad now that it is broadening. You're talking to Gareth Davies last night about the interest India is having in its own history now. Uh, World War Two and, and and Pakistan and and, and Nepal mm -hmm. and Gurkhas writing. I had Tim Garung, uh, a Gurkha author, on earlier this year, and he he believes he was the first Gurkha to be interviewed on a kind of YouTube channel. Wow. People have talked about Gurkha history, but not not given by not a on a different platform. Right? Yeah, they've been given by white people writing about Gurkha history and this that. And so, you know, I don't want to go to a big on tangent about this, but it's that it is important that World War Two is told from different points of view to reach different audiences because the the cliche as gareth and me talk about yesterday of the the red trouser wearing tweed jacket wearing middle class british guys writing about and reading history is a very important market but there's also lots of other people who are interested in history who are interested in their ancestry interested in what their fathers their grandfathers their grandmothers did and the more, the more different ways we approach World War II and tell that story, the more inclusive it becomes because it is ultimately everybody's war. Every single person in the world pretty much was caught up in that war, male, mm -hmm. female, white, brown, you know, and, and it's the, the more angles you can come at it, the better. So, Now, Paul, have you, have you seen the movie From Hell to Eternity with Jeffrey Hunter? I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. that character, Jeffrey Hunter, blonde, blue-eyed, Jeffrey Hunter is portraying Guy Galbadon. Guy Galbadon, yeah, yeah. I, I, a I Mexican American from East LA. Yeah. Nowhere in the film do you hear or any reference that he's of Mexican American descent. Yeah, Guy from was East a LA. five foot three, swarthy, dark, olive skinned, dark black, jet black haired, dark eyes guy played by a blonde haired Hollywood hunk. In fact, they do the Japanese more they're they're a fairer to the japanese in that film the enemy right right well he was raised Latino. yeah he was raised by a japanese family after afterwards or uh, uh, be, before going off to war and that's how he, he learned the language uh, and for those who are not familiar with the story guy galbagon uh of right there out of east la uh yeah. becomes a u.s marine but he was raised uh kind of adopted by a japanese family yeah prior to World War II. And I, I he mean, goes his, his book, I, I did my, my book review shows a couple of weeks ago, and his book, which you can't get anymore, called Su Su Suicide on Saipan. Mm -hmm. uh, I corresponded. So I've got a signed copy by a guy to me, and he sent me an interview of himself. And so he, he yeah, he's passed yeah. away now. But yeah, it's it's really important that we we get these, these and I'm not even going to say minority, because they, were, they weren't, like when we talk about Indians in Burma, we're talking about the opposite of that. There were more Indians in Burma than there were white guys. And when, that's why we talked about that in the Burma week, when people talk about the Burma campaign being a long, a, a, a campaign long way from home. And you go, well, it was a long way home for the people from England and Scotland, but it wasn't a long way from the people from India or Pakistan or because they it was just they were from the South Asia anyway. So it's the how it's how we we look at this history is interesting mm -hmm. because Burma is a long way away to us, but it's not a long way away if you're from Nepal or India. It's just yeah, right. So there we are. We're going off on a tangent now. But anyway, <laughs> um, people are asking about where they can get copies of the book. Obviously, there's links below there. Um, I will put back on screen. Dave is on, is on all sorts of social media. So the Facebook page, his own website there, Twitter, Instagram. Contact Dave, maybe getting signed copies, whatever it is. There's also the links there below to buy it through Bookstore. You can find it on all good bookshelves. And 
And I would say now get the book now, folks, because the, the early editions will go up in price once the TV show comes out. You'll want to have that first edition, you know, because there'll be a reprint with a with um the, with the, the stars of the show on the cover, and you want the you want the early one, and it's it's yeah. So so this 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 actual edition uh, from West Home Publishing what came about after Hollywood, you know, Wilmer Valderrama had shined this huge Hollywood light on this story now. Uh, and that's how I was able to uh, get with West Home Publishing and sign a deal with them. So I self-published it. Wilmer picked up the film rights as as a, my self-published book. And, and then I and then I signed a deal with West Home Publishing. And I think it's a really good message for anybody out there, because it happens all the time, who are who are interested in uh, Darren Little and he's interested in Burma, who's watching tonight. But, People think, oh, I can't do a book and nothing's going to happen if I do a book. It's lots of work. You, you can do a book and then you'll meet people and it'll spread there. And I'm not saying everybody who writes a book is going to get a Hollywood TV show made of their book because that kind of lightning only strikes quite infrequently. But it, you will make these little strides and connect with people. And it's important to tell these little stories. And I think as much as we like we talk about these operational studies and we look, people look at Sicily or Burma or it's these smaller stories that actually I think are the ones that we learn the most from because you are you learn about people. You learn about people who went to war and what happened to them. So like there to, we go. I like to say that there's a, there's five words that Hollywood cannot resist based on a true story. <laughs> I knew yeah. when I was writing this book that I had something very unique because this was this was a different story this was it was unique in in its own little way um if you have something like that uh it's definitely worth putting the time do the research uh get to writing the book and then and then the real work begins uh again it took me three years to finally from the time that the book got out that that hollywood actually picked it up yeah, um, I didn't have to pitch the story ever. Uh, Hollywood actually came knocking on my door, but um, you know that's that's something that you know if you put in the work and, and get the get get it out there, it, it, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna look at that. I mean, Hollywood don't put put money behind stories that aren't good the story has to be good i mean you know if, if a well written story i mean we we've discussed in other shows that you can tell. A, a well-written story is a well-written story, and it's uh, and and therefore has interest. And a badly written story doesn't get anywhere at all. You can the the events can be interesting, but a badly written story won't get off the ground. It's got to be written well and and bring that that story to light. So, well, there we are. Um, people are saying, do you recommend one edition or the other? If they're looking to buy it, do they buy the early one or the second one, or does it matter? Well, the early one is no longer. Uh, okay, my self-published book is no longer available. West Home Publishing and. You, if, if you're looking for a signed copy, the best way to get it is through my website. Send me a quick message and I'm, I'll email you right back and, and I can get a copy out to you. Uh, Paul, this is something that I'd like to do for your group. Any, how you want to do it, you can. I'm going to give away a free copy to one of your people that are on right now. Uh, and you can figure out how you want to do that. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. I'll, I'll take I'll, after the show. Thank you very much, Dave. I will take all the names in, in who've joined in the comments today and I'll yeah. do a draw and I'll let that person know that they'll get a free book or so. We'll, we'll work something out like that. I'll do yeah, um, absolutely. I'll do that. That's a very kind gesture, Dave. So thank you very much. So, um, well, we've, we've come full circle. We've learned a little bit about the Italian campaign. We've shone a light on a unit that doesn't get much. Um, well, hasn't had much of it, but will suddenly be. I feel like we're tapping into something in a few years' time. This will be like Band of Brothers, and we'll be that first. We'll have been the first YouTube channel to talk about it. I feel that we're we got in first now, and then when you're too big, and I'll have to go, I'll have to contact you via an agent in a few years. Uh -huh. I'll go, but Dave knows me. We've talked before, and they'll go. Yeah, I'm afraid Dave is busy today. You'll have to go through uh, his assistant. <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. Well, anyway, this has been brilliant talking to us. I'm going to just uh, remind people what we've got coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, that was a really good show. I knew it would be a good show. Tomorrow evening will be another equally uh, great show because you have the incredible Damien Lewis coming on talking about his book, SAS, uh, The Italian Job. So, as you know, anyone who's read any of Damien's books about the SAS and special operations and the long-range desert, yeah, this, uh, Damien's always good value. So he'll be beaming in tomorrow to talk about that. Then I'm, as soon as I'm finishing this show tonight, I'm having a pre-show discussion with my guests for the Italian Navy in World War II show, which will be Thursdays. I'm doing 
little pre-chat about that in a few minutes' time. And then Friday, we've got Julian Whippy coming on talking about uh, Medicina. So the, a two-hour battle that involved the Lorraine Gurkabatan and the 14th, 20th Hussars. There's lots of stuff coming up later on. But it remains me now to say thank you very much, Dave, for joining us. Um, thank you for having me. And uh, we'll keep in touch. And again, follow all the links down. I will. I will let. I will let someone know. I will do a draw. Who's who's won the free book? And thank you very much for doing that, Dave. So, as usual, folks, don't forget to check us out on Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Don't forget to share what we're doing on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram because more people deserve to see guests of Dave's caliber than we are currently getting. I'd love to start getting thousands of views rather than hundreds. It's a slow process. We'll get there eventually. But anyway. Thank you very much, Dave, for joining us. It's been really a pleasure. And I wish, I hope, I can't wait to see that the, the car, those casting announcements that come out on Variety or their magazine of whoever it is has been cast. That'll be a really, really cool thing for those of us who watched that show to see this show tonight, to see that next progression will be very exciting. So yeah. uh, enjoy your day, Dave. And if everyone else watching, I'll see you all again tomorrow to talk to Damien Lewis about the SAS in Italy. Thanks, everybody. See you again tomorrow. <laughs>